Good evening, everyone. My name is Liza Gentile, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at Johnson & Wales University and a proud alum. Thank you for joining us this evening for Enacting Real Change Through the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In honor of Black History Month, we've partnered with The Bridge for Diversity, Equity, and Social Justice to host this important program featuring alumni who work to create meaningful change in this area. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. First, I'd like to thank the Alumni Relations team for their help behind the scenes of this evening's session, especially Crystal Kendall, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations and proud JU alumna for her work to bring us this program tonight. Questions can be submitted throughout the session using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The questions will be posed to our panelists at the conclusion of the discussion. I'd also like to set the expectation that, that this discussion is a safe space for all, free from all forms of discrimination, harsh criticism, and harassment. We ask that you are respectful in the chat. Hate speech of any kind will not be tolerated and will result in removal from the program. Now, I would like to introduce our moderator and our panelists for tonight's discussion. Akanksha Aga, class of 2002, with her MBA, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Lowe's Hotels & Co. In her newly created role, Akanksha is responsible for developing, implementing, and overseeing Lowe's Hotels Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion initiatives. She collaborates with senior leadership to develop strategies that further an inclusive environment for all team members, from talent acquisition to team member engagement and retention. Akanksha was born and raised in India, learning to appreciate different cultures at an early age as her military family traveled state to state every other year. She started her career with the Taj Group of Hotels, a five-star hotel group in India. In 2001, she moved to the United States and earned her MBA in hospitality management from Johnson & Wales University in Providence. Upon graduation, she joined JWU to build their industry relations as director of employer relations, developed the university's partnership with global and national brands. Prior to joining Lowe's Hotels, Akanksha was the Experience Director at Flick Hospitality Group, where she led the Experience Strategy and Service Culture Differentiation. She chaired the Diversity and Inclusion Action Council with a thoughtful approach to celebrating diversity and fostering a culture of belonging. Akanksha believes that people are at the heart of, the hospita of hospitality and inclusive cultures have the power to unlock the best potential for each and every team member. Next, Marquise Cooper, Class of 2014, graduated from JWU with a degree in accounting and a concentration in finance, and he is currently pursuing his master's in finance at Bentley University. Marquise works as senior analyst and in global internal audit at Boston Scientific, where he serves on the Finance DEI Council and is leader for Bridge, an employee resource group dedicated towards enhancing the experience for Black employees and employees of color. He also serves on the board of directors for the Massachusetts Society of CPAs and their educational foundation. Trudy Lacey is the athletic director at JWU Charlotte campus, as well as the senior campus lead of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. She is also the chair of diversity, equity, and inclusion tax force. Trudy has achieved four United States Collegiate Athletic Association national championships for women's basketball, volleyball, men's soccer, and men's golf. Prior to her tenure at JWU, she coached with the WNBA and served as the assistant director for USA Women's Basketball from 1997 to 2001, helping Team USA earn gold in the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Lisa Ranglin, class of 2020 with her master's, was voted one of Rhode Island's most powerful and influential women by Rhode Island Monthly Magazine and is a Rosa Parks Award recipient from the NAACP Providence. Lisa is the president and CEO of the Rhode Island Black Business Association and a sought after professional who brings more than 20 years of corporate experience in risk management, change and project and program management. Ranglin is a certified executive coach, a certified project management professional with a Six Sigma Green Belt certification. Lisa has spent much of her career helping, build, helping business leaders and small businesses improve performance and increase profitability. Having knowledge of the leadership gap, she works tirelessly to ensure RIBBA becomes a model for what intentional work paired with impactful and persistent leadership can accomplish as we work towards greater social equity and economic advancement. 
Akanksha, I will now turn it over to you to get us started this evening. Thank you, Liza, for that warm welcome. And I'm really grateful to be here today and cannot wait to hear from our panelists. So welcome, Wildcats. Good evening. My name is Akanksha, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, my identity is Indian American. And I share that with you because um, while I am uh, a person of color, I cannot claim to have had the same experiences as our Black and African American colleagues. That's why we're here today. Each of us can play an active role in not only understanding and honoring Black and African American history, but in working towards the future. So we're really excited about what our panelists have to say. Before we do that, we'll just take a we'll take a quick look back into uh, what brought us today to where we are. 1976, that was the first year when Black History Month was recognized and celebrated. Almost 50 years after the fact, when Carter G. Woodson had recognized a week back in. Um, 1926, I believe, if I'm not wrong in doing the math correctly here, Marquise will have to correct me. But um, it's important to note that because it was a long time in the works. Uh, Woodson, in fact, was the second African-American to have earned his uh, PhD from Harvard University and was still unable to be hired by a university. He took it upon himself to lead multiple organizations, um, which then went on to honor and recognize the contributions of Black and African-American um, history. Each year, we spend the month of February celebrating the work and lives of African-Americans throughout history, while recognizing that this work should not be confined to one month alone. This year, the US Library of Congress curated a display exploring how African-Americans have resisted historic and ongoing oppression throughout the country's history. We want to recognize members of the JWU community who are committed to this work while reminding everyone that it is not the responsibility of those who have been impacted by racism and barriers. This responsibility falls on each of us. Tonight, we're extremely fortunate to welcome alumni and colleagues who work every day to change culture and policy, to break down the structures that inhibit equity and inclusion. We will learn about some of the current challenges we face in society, as well as in the areas that each of our panelists work. We'll also learn some of the best practices and strategies for success that have proven to work this work forward. So let's get right to it. My first question is to each of our panelists. Um, we'd love to know a little bit more about your role. So help us understand your role, um, knowing that it may or may not be related to DEI. And if we could start with Lisa, going on to Marquise, and then Trudy. Lisa? Yeah, so thank you so much. This is such a pleasure to be here. When I think of the question, um, my role in DEI from a you know from a woman's perspective, um, it's it's such a loaded question around my role. Um, I consider myself a disruptor as it relates to really um, breaking down barriers and creating opportunities and helping leaders to think about how they create environments with policies and best practices that really create. Um, organization where everyone feels like they're valued, they're supported, they're respected. Um, you know, quite often people said, I want to be, um, I want to be part of this journey, right? We know that DEI is a journey, but too often we think it's going to be this quick hit fix, right? You turn the switch on and it's all better. Well, this is a long journey. And one of the things that I absolutely love to do is to help leaders really think about how can they create spaces that works for everyone? So, you know, in my role as the CEO, um, president and CEO of the Rhode Island Black Business Association, I get to work um, quite often with leaders such as governors and mayors um, and CEOs across the state. And it's really around 
helping them understand the value around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, we got to create um, spaces where everyone feel welcome, and we got to make sure that we're doing it in a way where it's not just some of us is doing it. I think on the top of the hour, you talked about it's all of us, right? We're on this journey together. So for me, I get to sit in a space where I'm not just the only one. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are intentional doing this work. So it's all about policy, best practices, and making sure that we're creating safe space that all of us can thrive, not just some of us. Yeah, and uh, you know, from my side, uh, a, a couple of things were said at the onset. So I wear sort of two uh, DEI related hats outside of my day job. Uh, one of them is uh, serving on the, the Massachusetts uh, Finance DEI Council for uh, Boston Scientific, and it's essentially, you know, a collective effort of you know different finance uh, leaders and and contributors um, within the organization. Um, you know, focusing on everything from you know, uh, retention efforts to uh, recruiting practices um, to, you know, just kind of creating an inclusive environment in particular in the finance space, because that's something that I think a lot of companies, a lot of firms are, are struggling with um, just in terms of attracting and retaining talent. Um, and then on the flip side, uh, I serve as um, a lead for what we call Bridge. It's our Black Employee Resource uh, Group at the company. And we're one of 10 uh, now uh, strong ERGs that uh, cover everything from, you know, uh, we have a women's network, we have, uh, we just launched a new ERG called FIRE, uh, which uh, welcomes in, um, employees that um, identify as Indigenous um, or Native American um, in roots, um, LGBTQ, uh, we have our Pride uh, ERG and, and many others. And uh, I think the, the capacity that I serve in that in is, uh, Lisa referred to herself as a, as a disruptor, uh, I like to think that we get to to do a bit of that too, but also um, kind of collaborating in terms of figuring out where some of the the crossover and intersectionality is between uh, groups that identify as different things. And um, I would add one more point to to what Lisa had mentioned about uh, the journey. Uh, our chief diversity officer at the company, uh, you know, has a saying that she encourages all the ERG uh, leaders and all the DEI leads uh, to think about, and it's progress over time, not overnight. Um, it is a, a, a ongoing journey. We're a company of 40,000 plus uh, worldwide um, that has a lot of different cultures and, and backgrounds represented. So um, it is uh, a long journey, but a worthwhile one to, to make sure that we're creating an inclusive environment. Yes, yeah, so from my perspective, I bring a, a little bit of a different perspective uh, from the world of athletics. Uh, and uh, also on our campus, I, I am the, uh, the senior lead for our uh, diversity, equity, social, uh, and social justice programs. And uh, the importance of the work that we're doing uh, on our campus is to continue to develop uh, future leaders in this work. As Lisa mentioned, mentioned it's, it's a long journey. We have made progress. Um, as a people and as a nation, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, if you, you know, recently just look at the, the death of Tyree Nichols, um, it's evident that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, but we have been very proactive on our campus in developing programs so that uh, all of our students uh, have a sense of belonging and feel that they are being seen and being heard. Uh, we are one of two uh, Johnston Wells campuses, but our campus is a predominantly Black uh, institu institution. And so, you know, from our programs, we are really focused on uh, developing uh, equity and fairness uh, in, in the classroom as well as on the campus. Uh, on, and, and lastly, I'll close that we are very involved in the community. I am on the leadership team for the Charlotte Racial Justice Consortium. And on the athletic side, uh, we have uh, created the Athletes Social Justice Coalition. So we, as I said, uh, we're doing good work, but we have a lot more work to do. That's amazing. So I, I'm um, loving the fact that we have a group of disruptors here and it just brings to mind, of course, uh, the famous words of John Lewis. So thank you all for causing all the good trouble that you are, because we certainly need it, don't we? Um, I heard a few words that I wanted to, to lean in on. Um, I heard you speak of welcoming spaces 
of intention, certainly retention and recruiting efforts. Um, you know, I appreciate it too, through these comments because um, psychological safety is really important. Um, unfortunately, every time when we turn on the news and we hear of, of yet another uh, loss, it's, it's uh, hard to thrive when you're coping and navigating. Um, so a lot of these practices that you shared will go a long way. Let's, let's take a look now at um, defining success. From your perspective, how would you define and also measure success for those looking to um, launch their DEI programs or maybe they're already in DEI programs? And for the benefit of the audience, if you could perhaps include, is there a best practice that has worked for you? If we could perhaps begin, um, we'll switch it up a little. We'll go to Marquise, Trudy, and Lisa, please. Marquise. So uh, to be candid, it has to be more than just, you know, adding a rainbow to your LinkedIn profile for the company during Pride Month or posting a Martin Luther King quote or anything along those lines. You really have to look at uh, the, the inner workings of the company and how it can be felt throughout when we when we talk about an inclusive um, environment. And a couple of the best practices, uh, you know, that we are are building out at Boston Scientific um, and trying to to encourage is things like tying it to you know uh, compensation to again retention efforts. Um, in a lot of uh, companies, you always hear about you know making sure that we're encouraging more representation at the leadership level and making sure that people feel like they can see uh, themselves and all that. And that's all important but it's also you know uh, everything sounds great when you are at the ceo level or the c-suite and every initiative sounds great or if you're entry level just kind of coming in and and you know kind of fresh out of school and, and coming into a new uh, company but it's you know more about focusing on everybody that has been there for a while and that's kind of in that middle ground right that that you know is working their way through uh, different management levels or in middle management um, or, or trying to work their way uh, up the ladder and making sure that it's again felt throughout. So uh, when we talk about measuring success, again, tying it to companies, uh, again, compensation targets, uh, to strategic targets, not just uh, for employees to feel it, but also who and how we do business, right? Who we do business with. Um, do you, you know, do business with a diverse group of, of suppliers and, and vendors? Are you going out to, to different uh, events that, you know, you're helping either sponsor um, as a company or, or promote um, and who and how you're engaging with, uh, like Trudy was mentioning, how you're engaging with the uh, community. So, um, and, you know, it's easy enough to, once you get in the, the strategy aspect of it, it's easy enough to set some numbers and some targets to it as well. But you have to start with making sure that you're thinking about it at all levels, internally and externally. And then measuring it is actually the easy part um, once you started thinking about that from my side. Is it, is it me? Yes, I thought so. Sorry. Uh, yes, um, just just to add to that, I, I think that uh, a, a, a good common sense practice is to appreciate diverse thought. Uh, you know, research has shown that you know individuals like to work and be around those who look like themselves and act like them each other and you know have the same thoughts and beliefs and. It's very difficult to grow when you do not have uh, diverse diversity uh, diversity of thought at the table, and you know, as we had talked about, especially at the executive level and 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 the C-suite level, um, we can see a a, a huge uh, gap in, in representation. And so, again, you know, we talk about diversity and increasing um, diverse uh, talent pool, but when it actually comes. Uh, to hiring and promoting, many times, uh, uh, you know, black people and people of color, especially yeah. black females, um, you know, are, are left behind. And you know, again, uh, you know, sports is a metaphor for life. I'll give you another example. Here in Charlotte, we had our interim uh, uh, Panthers football coach uh, who won more games in half of a season than the previous coach had won in two seasons. Yet he was not hired. Uh, to be the head coach, they hired another gentleman uh, who 
had a losing re record. And so sometimes that can be so discouraging because you can do the work, you can be prepared and you can still be looked over. So I think it's important to um, you know always keep um, DEI in mind, not, not only in mind, but also in action and uh, in our strategic planning to uh, continue to have those conversations and also set goals and metrics to uh, help us measure how we are really doing in those spaces. Yeah, I'm doing my head nods, right? Um, spot on there. I think a, a lot of it is around, you know, add in, again, you all did such great job with kind of talking about um, this question, but I'll add just a little bit about many cases, um, folks are not thinking about these strategic um, priorities. I think what we've seen and we've probably heard recently around the lack of prioritization as it around, around, you know, about diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? They're seeing it like this nice thing to do. I'm gonna check the box, right? Um, and I think until companies really getting down to diversity, equity, and inclusion is a critical business element, right? It has to be included in every aspect of your organization. It can't be this nice thing to do. It can't just be some picture on the wall with some brown people, right? It has to be meaningful. And I think too often um, what we've seen is a lot of lip service, to be honest. We see a lot of statement that's issued, but when you ask them to show the data, what does your board seat looks like? You know, when you think of um, retention, what does that look like? hiring practice. Where are you going to find people? You're saying, I can't find black and brown individuals. They're not applying. Well, why that is? A recent study um, by CNBC, um, Survey Money um, Monkey, they interviewed probably hundreds of workers that are currently in the workforce. And they cited that 80% of workers said they will never go to a company to work at a place that do not value diversity equity and inclusion. And this study was done um, in 2021, 80%. I mean, that is huge. When we, we know we're in a, a workforce, right, where it's really tough to find talented individuals, right? Um, one of the things that I've seen, I've spent many years in banking and what I've seen, and, and Trudy, you talked about, you know, people of color, especially black women. As a black woman that just left corporate after 20 odd years, um, it was very traumatic. It's like trauma <laughs> because you don't see anyone that looks like you in leadership, right? There's very few people that look like you and you can't, it's hard to say, well, I'm going to work my butt off to get up into leadership when there's no one there that looks like me, right? So I think companies have to really be serious about their pathway for growth. I mean, many companies that I've talked with, they don't even have a pipeline program. So how are you going to build a bench if you have no individuals in your pipeline program? You don't have any emerging leaders development program. And if you have any of those development program for leaders, you're only you know, tapping selected people. You're not tapping those black individuals that are working their butts off. You're not going to the brown ones, right? You're identifying these selective few. And how many of us have been a part of companies where when they talk of diversity, they hire a white woman. So their diversity is to say, well, look, we have 10 white women in leadership, but then you have zero black, zero brown. And then that's that, what they're saying here, look how great we have done, right? We now have some white female. If you really wanna change the landscape from a leadership perspective for pipeline programs, you gotta be intentional. And I think too often, we're using the same strategies that we've used for decades and we expect to see different results. So I will challenge all of us that are here on this call, be that change, ask those tough questions. I wanna see your DEI data as it relates to board pipeline, your hiring practice. How many black or brown people you're interviewing when you said, oh, they're, they didn't show up, they didn't know. Can you start thinking about potentially evaluating your, your job description. Do you need a bachelor's degree for somebody to do data entry or whatever it may be, right? So I think it's really being intentional, evaluating what are those key essential skills that are actually needed to do the job. How many of us 
got hired for a role that we applied for. And then when we actually got to work to start working, it was nothing like what we saw in the job specs. I know I'm not the only one, right? I see nods, right? Exactly. So we got to get real. We got to be intentional and we got to speak up. Too often leaders are sitting on the fence and they see something, but they don't do anything. So, you know, we're in doing good trouble, right? John Lewis talked about good trouble. And I think we can't be afraid. We got to be brave. If you see something and it smells funny, it's bad. So make sure you're, you're being bold, unapologetic, and just drive change. I think all of us bring something unique to the table. Collectively, we can make a lot of things happen. I see some applauses going on, and I'm sure those are not the only ones. Um, I really appreciate the real talk because if we keep on doing what we've always done, we're going to keep on getting what we've always gotten, right? And um, each of you have commented on so many things here. So um, any one and done type of strategy is not going to work, clearly based on what our, our panelists are sharing. We have to look at it as a multi-pronged approach um, and one that looks both at, at employees or team members at clients and customers, community. There's so many elements here. Um, the data, love the data, and really drilling down into the data because, um, you know, very similar to what you mentioned, I was looking at the report by McKinsey, where it speaks to uh, Black employees in particularly, mentorship is there, but it's not translating into sponsorship. And so, um, if you have individuals in your organizations, um, you know, it's also about advocating and sponsoring, right, so that they can then grow into those next roles. And um, one of the things that I like to challenge folks with if I'm doing a training or workshop is to say, um, when you look at your succession plan um, and you look at the org structure, how many levels down in the org structure are you going before you see somebody um, that is, that is black, that is brown, um, that is um, you know, diverse in multiple ways because there's, there's also intersectionality that we need to, to understand. So thank you all. I have a lot of notes from, from each of your, your um, brilliant responses here. We'll go into some one-on-one um, -on -one questions to, to get your individual expertise as well. And uh, this one's for Marquise. Um, so Marquise, you shared some great examples. We'd love to get to know a little bit more about what companies can do to create an inclusive workspace. Um, could you share some practices that have worked? Because as we said, it's one thing to have a diverse um, workforce, but then that goes along with inclusion and psychological safety, right? So any practices that you could share would be great. Yeah, a, a couple, and, and just to add on to what uh, Trudy and Lisa were mentioning, um, just again, going back to the whole representation uh, importance of it, right? Um, I, would, I would add to that, not just representation, um, again, at leadership levels, but kind of throughout. I wanna see myself in the folks that I report to, but also my peer group too, right? Um, that is one way just, uh, I think, easily that, that companies can kind of uh, work towards creating an inclusive environment is again, going back to not just recruiting practices, going to that whole diverse slate, uh, you know, recruiting best, uh, best practice, but what are you doing as far as retention? What are you doing as far as, like Lisa mentioned, development, um, mentorship and coaching and all uh, those types of things? What are you doing to keep the, you're doing all this stuff to get folks in the door. What are you doing to keep them there once they're there um, and to keep them happy and thriving, right? Uh, on the notion of, you know, kind of creating the space, you know, Give an example. Uh, I think Trudy had mentioned uh, Tyree Nichols um, at the at the top of the hour, and you know, it's again we we've been kind of going through this obviously for for decades, but um, within the last couple of years or so, it's been an extra added layer of of trauma and of uh, you know hardship. I think for a lot of folks that see themselves in a Tyree, in a Breonna Taylor, in a George Floyd, or or what have you. And to be frank, that makes it hard to go to work the next day a lot of times um, and really be uh, the best employee and the best self. And, and sometimes you really just uh, need a, a space to release if you are going to be kind of in a space uh, trying to do your job in an eight hour a day. So 
Um, one of the things that we try to do with uh, Bridge and, and our other ERGs is when things like this happen, um, you know, we, and I'm sure a lot of companies hopefully do this, but we have your kind of standard uh, town hall, open forum, uh, safe space, and we invite, it's invitation, uh, it's open invitation, um, but we harness, we make sure to focus on uh, Black employees or employees that kind of identify with uh, the groups that are affected. And, you know, just like with this uh, last, uh, you know, uh, incident with, with Tyree Nichols, his murder, um, you know, we had an open forum and people were able to share, uh, again, how it impacted them, how it impacts them doing their day-to-day -day jobs, how, you know, it, it, it affects them on a, on a regular basis. And um, just being able to hear, uh, one, that you're not alone in how you feel, two, employees feeling, uh, your, your coworkers and colleagues feeling uh, the ability to be a bit vulnerable and to, and to open up to get to, again, uh, make you feel like you're not alone. Um, and three, just to be honest, and, and it helps you kind of resonate, uh, you know, with with those feelings. The the other thing too is what we've been um, encouraging a lot at Boston Scientific um, is just employee uh, personal services, right? So um, oftentimes, you know, you know, you have your standard HR uh, department; they do everything with compensation and you know hiring and all that type of stuff. But what else are you providing to your employees as far as things like? mental health, um, emotional uh, health, and all those types of things, because uh, we've been through a lot of trauma just in the last couple of years with the pandemic and everything else. So uh, folks are stressed out, uh, Black folks in particular. So what are you offering? And I encourage folks, if you're interviewing for a job or if you're looking for, for different places to work, um, there's no harm in asking kind of what's what the company is doing for its employees, right? What do you have to offer if I'm going to give you my time and labor and, and those types of things? So. Um, I could go on and on with examples, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, companies need to make sure they're taking care of their employees as much as the employees are taking care of the company. So, yeah, that's very important. You cannot cannot expect um, your folks to come in the next day and just get to work, leave alone, leave alone, thrive. And um, you know, we had a similar conversation. We were actually in the midst of our Black and African American history planning activity. And we just, I said, let's, let's, let's pause. Let's just all take a moment because uh, we, we, we can't honor and reflect until we first figure out what everyone needs to do um, to just cope, to just cope. And it was a really um, important moment where several of our Black and African American colleagues shared how they've spoken to their children um, and, and, um, that's, that's a conversation I, I haven't had, I don't need to have, and I, I understand my, um, you know, unearned advantages there. So that's, that's important for us, um, those who are listening to each of you to, to lean in and pay attention to that. Um, let's go over to, to Lisa. Lisa, um, you shared, um, some, some really wonderful points earlier on. Um, we'd love to now zoom in a little into community engagement activities. Um, what types of community engagement activities should a company consider adding to um, their their intent, their intentional DEI strategies? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Let me let me just pause for a moment because Marquise, that was heavy for me. Um, Being a black mom, um, it's tough. It's tough to just, even just to hear it. Um, it's 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 just quite difficult. It's not easy. Um, so just that, <laughs> just totally, I'm off track right now. Um, it's hard being a black mom and worrying, constantly worrying about your children and folks in your family, black boys, black men, it is quite difficult. It's not easy. And it it just surfaced so much. I remember when George Floyd got killed, I was still in corporate and who remember the riots, the protests, all of that. And no one asked all the black, cause I checked with black folks. I mean. Anybody asks you how you're doing? No one asked us how we were doing. Folks were, were really, they cared about the buildings, what right was happening to the buildings, right? But no one took the time 
to say, and we got on meetings. We had status meeting and all these kinds of meetings, right? But nobody took the time to say, how are you feeling? And most of, you know, often we're not doing okay. I mean, we are doing this code switching, right? Because we're at work and we got to do what we need to do to survive. But we are code switching and we're hurting. So I want to put that out there. It is not easy being a Black man, a Black woman, um, because, yeah, you're going to have to have that conversation with your children. Sometimes you have to think, oh, my God, I waved a police officer the other day to go. I was coming out of a street and I literally had panic attack to say, what if he thought I had a weapon in my hand, even though I would say you could go, right? I literally panicked. A black woman should not be going to work and have to feel like if she give a person the go away to feel like they should, could be shot, right? And I had that panic attack drive into work. That is not okay, but that's the society we live in. So come back to your question around um, community engagement. Um, there are so many things that, you know, when I'm on boards of different organizations and I encourage them often, to go into communities to think about the products and services that they're offering in communities, right? So um, I shared with you all, I, I spent many years, 20 odd years in banking. So we do products and services, whether it's mortgage, credit card, student lending, whatever it may be. You cannot just do it from your four walls in your office. You gotta get out into the community, right? You got to engage. And engagement means not just going to school and read to kids, that's great. But how many times we just go into a classroom and we read for an hour and then we post on social media, oh my God, look what I did, this was great. That's nice, right? But it's not moving the dial. Yesterday I was at a board meeting and we talked about families that are on SNAP, right? Families that are low income, that we, you know, spend a, a chunk of their time getting money from the government. They're probably working, but you know, everything is hard right now. That the in Rhode Island, the electric bill is fifty percent increase. Food insecurity, all of those things are happening right now. Come end of February, what will happen? A whole bunch of people that's on assistant will lose probably about one hundred and fifty dollars from their food stamp program their check that they get every month. They probably won't know until they go into stop and shop to say, wait a minute, I thought I had X amount of dollars. Now I'm like hundred dollars less. So one of the things I was sitting in that board meeting, what I said, this is not our lane. I hear it, it's not our lane. However, we are engaged in customers and we must try to tell them that this is gonna happen, right? So they're not going to the market and finding out on their car that they have 50 or $100 less to spend. Hey, you have influence, call the food bank, get them ready, call churches, notify government, notify whomever that this is going to happen. Because we're talking about notifying a whole bunch of families that will be hardest hit. So uh, it's about flipping what we used to do in engagement in communities you need to use your power and influence. It's not, don't say it's not your lane. It's not my responsibility. Government needs to do this. As leaders, all of us must step up and say, how can I be of service to those people that are at the bottom, that are on the fringes of society, that are struggling to make ends meet? And in many cases, they're working up to 80 hours and they're getting, in some cases, minimum wage or less than. We got to step up as leaders and we got to move out of our little bubbles, right? And we got to be there to help real people because it's tough. Homelessness is, is off the chain. Food insecurity, you name it, it's, it's, it's really bad. And I think leaders, we got to get out of our own way and be in communities to be of service. The other thing that I would invite us to do as we think about community engagement, if you're in an organization and you have lots of skills, nonprofit organization can benefit from your skills-based volunteer. For example, if you do marketing or communications, go help them tell the stories of the work that they're doing. 
don't just write on, on LinkedIn or on Twitter or wherever you're at. Take those skills and go volunteer with a nonprofit and says, I want to help you leverage what I'm good at that I use in corporate every day or wherever I'm at to help them tell incredible story, to help them paint their building if they're rehabbing it. Whatever you do, show up and be intentional. And I am going to stop talking because I have all kinds of emotion that is going on right now. Marquise, thank you for sharing that and Judy for talking about the debt of Tyree. It is, um, you see the code switching? So I was, it's, it's tough, right? You're going through all these emotions and it's real um, and it's painful in most cases. Um, so I see you, Judy. I see you, Marquise. I know we're in this journey together as Black folks and it is hard as hell. And that's one of the reasons why I left corporate and people thought I was going, oh my God, Lisa's having a nervous breakdown. She just walked away from her job. She has no package. She has no nothing and she's leaving. Well, I was the happiest camper when I dropped my laptop off. I literally jumped for joy. I was liberated. And now I get to do this incredible work that I absolutely love, driving, driving changes throughout our state. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that, because it's um, what each of you have done is not easy. And that, you know, that's yet another element that um, we started off with, that this, this work um, of not only navigating through that, but also then sharing your experiences. That's not easy. So really um, very deeply appreciative to each of you for having shared that. Um, I'll share with the audience, you know, when we had a quick prep session, um, this was not planned. Uh, this just happened and this is reality. And, and we hope that uh, we don't have to keep having those conversations, but the reality is that uh, our, our colleagues need the time, the space, um, and, and uh, should not have to hide that emotion, right? The code switching, as, as you mentioned, you can't really be engaged if you're, if you're trying to blend in and assimilate and hide who you are. And definitely an important call out to our colleagues about um, true allyship versus performative allyship. That's really important. So let's listen, let's learn, let's act. Let's be true allies and not performative. Um, we're, we're going to make sure we have some time here for Q&A. So we'll go into our very last question for each of you. Um, let's see if we can maybe even do this a bit, a bit rapid fire style um, because we're looking ahead. We're looking ahead. We've got to make sure this critical work continues. How can we have a more sustainable impact? So let's share one takeaway from each of you. What is one takeaway that you'd like our audience to leave with um, in terms of making sure that this critical work continues? We'll go Trudy, Lisa, and Marquise. I will keep it short and sweet. What I would say is keep showing up, keep bringing it up, keep moving it forward. Faith over fear, um, purpose and passion over position. Uh, a lot of times we feel that we are not in a position to make change, to have our voices heard, but we are. And I wanna encourage everybody to keep showing, it, showing up, keep bringing it up. Yeah, I think, you know, um, cons consistency, right? I think being ready to have the conversation what I would encourage us to do, if you see something, say something. Too often somebody say something, you know, these, um, and maybe he or she, they didn't mean to say that. That's not what they meant. Let's have the conversation. And as Judy says, we got to push for, we can't let it come off our radar, right? If something happens and it comes back, a statement is issued and it's, it's like, sort of symbolic, right? We got to make sure that we are continuing this. It's a journey. So it's not like you're done. You put out a statement. That does not mean you're done, right? Be that voice. All of us have power in our voice and we must use it to drive changes in a meaningful way and really think about how do we implement and sustain 
sustainability is the key. Too often we throw some stuff in and then we have no clue how it's going to move forward and how it's going to be sustained. And if you're like me, when they say it's never going to happen, you just keep saying like the broken record. You just keep going at it. They say this is not going to happen. Well, I go up to the state house and I mobilize the community and stuff happen. And if they don't want to listen nicely behind closed doors, then I take to social media and I call them out. So whatever method you can use, use your voice, use your platform. Change is never easy, but if we keep at it and we mobilize the community, we can drive a lot of changes. And if we stay together, we can move those blockers <laughs> out of the way that enjoys the status quo. I know none of us on this call enjoys that, but there are people out there that like to keep us in poverty, like to keep what we have, we've been talking about forever. But if we stick together and stay consistent, we can win. I, I am 100%, 150% confident if we just stay the course, we can be victorious. All right, you want me to follow? You want me to follow that? Um, <laughs> you got see. it. Yeah. Uh, no, so uh, Trudy and Lisa, I think, gave great advice for all of us. I think I would like to give um, advice to um, companies and corporate America uh, in, in general. Um, my biggest takeaway from conversations like these is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be more than just um, an extension of your HR department to, you know, uh, be able to kind of promote out there, right? It has to be more than just um, an effort to, again, post some quotes, post some pictures, and, and uh, promote the, the company as, as this open place. It has to be something that is felt throughout at all levels um, and in all functions and aspects, right? Again, going back to your hiring practices, your compensation, and making sure that everybody has and feels like they have um, a seat at the table. We have so many of these uh, ERGs and, and DEI councils and, and functions and all those kind of uh, popping up, and we saw a big, uh, you know, um, we saw a big explosion of it over the last couple of years, and. We don't want those types of efforts to uh, certainly not be diluted or uh, go, you know, un, uh, you know, unheard or unchecked. Uh, so I would encourage companies um, in all industries, um, especially if you are in industries that are more people facing or people uh, centric or customer centric, um, you have to again build DEI into your fabric and into your uh, company strategy again at all levels in all aspects and in all ways. It can't just be an add-on to, to HR that you uh, put on your, your fact sheet. It has to be a part of the company um, itself, full stop. Otherwise, we're just all kind of having a nice, fluffy conversation. Well said, well said. Um, if I may add to that, the, the piece that I would add is, is making sure yeah. that um, you have resources uh, because without resources, it's very hard. And, and you know, I'm really delighted to, to be in that opportunity where we do have resources. Um, so you can then roll things out, measure success, and come back and, and keep on doing that. And, and I think each of you also spoke about different elements, right? So there's diversity, there's inclusion. Let's not forget about belonging. Let's definitely not forget about equity and understanding what that means, right? So each of those could pretty much have their own goals and objectives as well. So thank you, great, um, great advice. I'm looking at the questions here. And the first one that we have from the audience is, what areas or fields need the most help? Um, tech, finance, business, et cetera. And um, not sure if any one of our panelists would like to go first. So I actually um, saw an article very recently, and believe it or not, the construction industry is one of the industry that is booming from a growth perspective, and we don't have enough women in construction. And that is talk about the you know the roads and the bridges and the school construction that are being kicked off with federal dollars. So that's a huge trend. Um, 
back in the days, I would say the tech space, because that's where I came from initially. But we're seeing a lot of layoff in tech, even though we still don't have enough women. So I would say construction in my mind would be because that's where most of the money from a federal perspective is coming right now. And very few women are sitting in those seats. Yeah, I'll just quickly add, I think everywhere, uh, whether you look at corporations, you look at tech, you look at sports, you look at higher ed, uh, you know, at those executive levels, the decision making levels, the diversity is is really lacking. I mean, and I mean, for example, I mean, you look at able folk versus disabled folk, you know, so um, we still have a lot of work to do. And I think in every area, um, there can be improvement made. I'm going to add a little bias, uh, accounting and finance, uh, just to to add that out there. Um, and we actually we uh, read a couple of studies on this, um, even just in the, the Massachusetts area. There is a need and there's money to be made, but we need more of us um, in the industry, both in uh, what I do now, um, kind of in the industry centric, but also in public accounting too. Uh, there is a need, there is an opening um, in a window, and there are folks that are interested in mentoring, um, you know, individuals that are interested in, in accounting and finance. So, but there's a need. So if I can add a little bias to the conversation, thank you, Trudy, for including everybody. But if I had to pick an industry, I'm going to pick mine. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. And, and I think it truly is all industries. I mean, hospitality, I, I wouldn't even say an opportunity. I think we have we have a responsibility to to open up pathways and and, and mentor because we we certainly have um, the diversity in our in our front line and emerging leadership. So we have another great question here. Um, what is your advice for people who have been passed over multiple times, career growth, and um, don't feel safe? Um, I I would say it's time to call one of us and explore opportunities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just getting ready to say that. You have you have overstayed your welcome and it's time to check out. But yeah, call us. <laughs> well, I, I was gonna I was just gonna add, you know, find find an advocate. Find somebody that can advocate for you and that really can go to 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 bat for you and is and, and really really an ally uh for you. You know, you obviously have to do the work and be prepared, but once you've done that uh, and you, you know, again, I'm in sports, you know, it take it takes a team to win. So uh, that would be my advice. That's great. Next question. This is great. How do you counteract comments from leadership such as we just hire or promote the best person of the job, regardless of race or gender? <laughs> it, uh, should we have the colorblind conversation? <laughs> well, I, I, um, my counter automatically is again define best. That's right. How do you quantify? How do you measure that? What are you talking right. about? Right? Yeah. Give me, give me the checklist and show me what boxes that I did. So yeah, we, we can yeah. Uh, remove color for for practical purposes. Just show me the checklist and what I didn't check off. And then if I'm checking everything off and it's still not adding up, then we need to have a different conversation. But my challenge to that is always uh, show me what I am missing before right. we even uh, talk further. Agree. The, yeah. the a lot more... of it could just be your name, right? Um, mm. If you have a name like mine, Lisa Ranglin, they don't realize that I'm black until I show up, right? So yeah. if you have a different name, like my daughter has, of course, they see your resume with a master's in accounting. They still give her that, oh, wait, maybe let's shuffle her somewhere else, right? And Marcus, she's an accountant and, and she hates it. <laughs> Lisa, we, you don't want to have the name conversation with me. <laughs> but I, I think um, I agree with all of you, right? Make it, make it as objective as possible. Make your hiring criteria objective. Make sure you have inclusive hiring practices. Make sure you have perhaps a panel where you have a diverse team interviewing. I know that sounds like a lot of work, but that'll bring results because if you have a diverse team that's interviewing, that automatically diversifies the perspective. Absolutely. So, you know, um, these are these are really great questions. And again, very, very appreciative of each of you and the honest, straight, helpful talk. Um, and what I'd like to do at this point is, is uh, pass the mic over to Crystal Kendall, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations, 
um, to close out our evening. Krista? Thank you, Akanksha, and thank you to our extraordinary panelists today for taking the time to discuss this important topic. With this being in Black History Month, your insights are extremely valuable, and I know our audience, and definitely me personally, have absolutely learned something from each of you tonight, which is greatly appreciated. Um, again, in the same space, so the conversation does need to be had, so I greatly appreciate hearing from it from so many different angles. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our alumni and students for attending tonight. I hope that you found the discussion insightful. As you know, JWU continues to provide a truly unique and exceptional education that prepares our students for future success. With your support, the Bridge for Diversity, Equity, and Social Justice provides educational programs, workshops, and resources to promote inclusive excellence, human rights, and social justice. As an alum, by giving a gift, you demonstrate your excellence. Oh, nope. You invested. Ew, sorry, guys. As an alum, by giving a gift, you demonstrate your investment in our mission, which can inspire additional support from other members of the JWO community, as well as corporate donors and foundations. You can make your gift today by clicking the link in the chat window. Thank you for your support. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed tonight's program, part of our JWO Connects family of programming. I hope that you will join us again in the future. For a full listing of upcoming events, please visit the event calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. And thank you again for your time. Um, such an important topic, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.